Hey, Dr. Morgan Nolte here, founder of Zivly and the Reshape Your Health podcast. We help you lower insulin resistance for long-term weight loss and better health. In today's episode, you'll learn 15 tips to get better sleep after age 50. But really, these tips work no matter your age. Sleep is one of the most overlooked aspects of weight loss and disease prevention. Like many people who don't know better, I used to say, I'll sleep when I'm dead, but then I learned better. If your sleep is chronically compromised, then your metabolism might be too. In his book, Outlive, Dr. Peter Atia states that sleep researcher Eve Van Cotter of the University of Chicago subjected healthy young people to severely restricted sleep just four and a half hours a night and found that after four days, they had the elevated insulin levels of obese middle-aged diabetics, and worse yet, approximately a 50% reduction in their capacity for glucose disposal. This turns out to be one of the most consistent findings in all of sleep research. No fewer than nine different studies have found that sleep deprivation increases insulin resistance by up to a third. Compounding the insulin resistance issue, poor sleep and stress go hand in hand. Higher stress levels can make us sleep poorly, as we all know, but poor sleep also makes us more stressed. It's this feedback loop. Both poor sleep and high stress activate the sympathetic nervous system. This causes an increase in cortisol and thus blood sugar and insulin. Higher insulin levels drive more fat storage and make weight loss difficult. Aside from this rise in cortisol, poor sleep increases hunger and reduces satiety, having a double-edged sword against weight loss. So a cornerstone in any weight loss or health program should be to get at least seven to eight hours of quality sleep each night. Research shows that good sleep in middle age is especially important for preventing cognitive decline later in life. So let's get to the tips. The first is to be sure that you have open airways. This may mean getting assessed for obstructive sleep apnea. If you snore, have high blood pressure, feel tired most days, or if your partner has observed that you stop breathing occasionally during the night, you should get further testing done. The prevalence of sleep apnea increases with weight and age, and men are at a greater risk. Obstructive sleep apnea leads to a disruption in your breathing at night, which leads to interrupted sleep. If needed, you can ask your doctor to write a prescription for a sleep study, and then from there you can get a CPAP or other breathing device to make nighttime breathing easier. It's important to maintain open airways at night, and personally, until I had my septum corrected, I had to wear Breathe Right nose strips every night. While they were annoying, the better sleep was well worth the trade-off. So you could consider those or a mouthpiece that some dentists make as well. The second tip is to adjust your light and noise environment. Your brain is wired to be awake when it's light and asleep when it's dark. Make your bedroom as dark and quiet as possible and remove all lights. If you have a digital clock, move it to a nearby room or turn it around or cover it up with something dark. Your room should be completely dark and quiet. If that's not possible for whatever reason, wear an eye mask to block the light. You might also want to consider earplugs to drown out any noise. The third tip is to wear amber colored blue light blocking glasses in the evenings. I recommend putting them on about two hours before you want to be asleep. Your brain uses the amount of blue light in the environment to modulate your circadian rhythm or your sleep-wake cycle. The more blue light there is in the environment, the less melatonin your brain will produce and the less sleepy you will be. Blue light is emitted in high amounts from our phones, tablets, and TVs. If you're choosing to be on those at night without amber-colored blue light blockers, you're dampening your melatonin production and sabotaging your sleep. While these glasses aren't very sexy, they do work to help you both fall asleep and stay asleep. The fourth tip is to use only passive technology at night. Stay off social media and don't watch or listen to things that get you thinking or fired up. One large scale survey found that the more interactive devices that subjects use the hour before bedtime, the more difficulties they had falling and staying asleep. 
whereas passive devices such as watching TV or using music players and books were less likely to be associated with poor sleep. This may partially explain why watching TV before bed does not seem to affect sleep quite as negatively as playing video games or scrolling through social media. The fifth tip is to keep your environment cool, and this makes sense from a circadian perspective. Think about how the outdoor temperature naturally cools off at night. That's to help us sleep. But because we've created our own little environments inside our home, we can keep the thermostat wherever we want. You will sleep better in a slightly cooler environment. If like me, your toes are freezing at night, you can wear socks, use a heating pad on them, or my favorite, drive your partner crazy and put your cold toes on them. If you're struggling with hot flashes, there are cooling mattress pads, cold packs, or specialized mattresses that you can use to adjust your temperature. Know that sugar and alcohol tend to be two big triggers for hot flashes. Taking a hot bath, shower, or using a sauna before bed can help too, because once you get out of the hot environment, your body temperature drops, which can help signal your body that it's time to sleep. The sixth tip is to reduce or eliminate alcohol, especially in the hours before bed. While alcohol is a sedative and may help you fall asleep, once it's metabolized in the body, it hinders getting into deep sleep. If you're going to drink, try to do it earlier in the day so that it's out of your system by bedtime. The seventh tip is to cut back on caffeine. Now caffeine works by inhibiting the receptor for a chemical called adenosine, which normally helps us go to sleep every night. Over the course of the day, adenosine builds up in our brain, creating what sleep scientists call sleep pressure or the drive to sleep. We may be tired and needing sleep, but if we ingest caffeine, it essentially blocks the receptor for adenosine so that sleep pressure doesn't build and your brain doesn't get that message to be sleepy. Everyone differs in their caffeine tolerance based on their genes and other factors. Some people can metabolize it quickly and others won't. The half-life of caffeine or how long it takes for half of it to clear your system is highly variable person to person, but research supports a half-life of about three to 10 hours. This means that for some people, 10 hours after you have a cup of coffee, half of that caffeine is still in your system. Caffeine has been shown to reduce melatonin production, sleep quality and quantity, increase the time needed to fall asleep and increase morning fatigue. One of our Zibli members eliminated caffeine and wore blue light blockers and saw a dramatic increase in her sleep quality and quantity. She was over the moon because she'd struggle with poor sleep like five hours or so a night for like 20 years. While stopping the caffeine was a significant change for her, the trade-off of better sleep and more energy was worth it. The eighth tip to improve sleep is to exercise. Exercise helps build that sleep pressure that we discussed earlier, especially zone two cardio, but not within two to three hours of bedtime. If this exercise can be done outside, that's even better, which brings us to the ninth tip to improve sleep, which is to get morning and daytime sunlight. Getting morning sunlight and sunlight throughout the day helps reset and modulate your sleep-wake cycle, and any bit is better than none. The morning sunlight is best to get within about 90 minutes of sunrise because there's more red light in the morning sunrise and evening sunset than throughout the rest of the day. This red light is a signal to our brain to either rev up or wind down depending on whether that red light is followed by brighter light or by darkness. So if you use red light therapy, it's best incorporated into your morning routine or evening routine for this reason. The 10th tip is to not eat within three to four hours of bedtime. While it's not recommended to be ravenous going to bed, that would actually be a distraction to sleeping, having a healthy meal high in protein, fiber, and healthy fat and then no food after that meal until your first meal the following day will help with sleep. The 11th tip is to give yourself plenty of time to sleep, and this one's commonly overlooked. If your goal is to get eight hours of sleep each night, you should plan to be in bed eight and a half to nine hours. Having unrealistic sleep expectations can be a stressor, which is counterproductive to good sleep. It's okay to have some wind down time. 
An evening routine can help prime your body to fall asleep faster, but it will still take a little time. And if you get up to use the restroom, which is common and normal one to two times a night, then you'll want to account for that added time to get back to sleep. As a side note and the 12th tip, if you're finding your sleep interrupted by frequent trips to the bathroom in the middle of the night, try reducing your water intake in the evening. Give your body time to get rid of the water before you want to be asleep. Now this does mean that you're going to be going to the bathroom more during the day, especially in the beginning when you start drinking more water, but over time your body will adjust and the trade-off for better sleep is worth it. The 13th tip to sleep better is to have a consistent sleep-wake time, even on the weekends. Your body likes routine, so having a morning and evening routine is great for your sleep-wake cycle. So treat your own sleep schedule like you would your young child. I don't know about your house, but bedtime is big in our house. We understand the importance of sleep for our children's mood, growth, and learning potential. We are very intentional about their evening routine and try to keep their bedtime and wake time consistent. My husband and I need this for our own relationship and our own mental health. This need for consistency doesn't change with age. If anything, it becomes even more important because we become less resilient to stress as we age. Just ask any 30 year old who has a night out like they used to in college. The conversation the next morning is inevitably something like, I can't believe we used to do that multiple times a weekend. My husband and I often joke that we'd do more fun stuff if we like to stay up late, but we don't. And when the occasional time comes where we do stay up late, we definitely feel it more now than we did in our early 20s. The 14th tip is to try hormone replacement therapy and or supplements for sleep. Now this topic could be a video of its own, but for the right woman going through perimenopause or menopause, hormone replacement therapy, especially progesterone, can be a godsend to improve her sleep. Other common sleep supplements are melatonin, valerian root, ashwagandha or holy basil if the issue is stress related, and magnesium among others. One popular sleep aid is the sleep cocktail from Dr. Andrew Huberman. He suggests 145 to 400 milligrams of magnesium threonate or glycinate, and these should be taken about 30 minutes to three hours before you wanna to go to sleep, as well as 200 to 400 milligrams of theanine and 50 milligrams of apigenin daily. Also, two milligrams of glycin to be taken every third or fourth night, and 100 milligrams of GABA to be taken every third or fourth night. That's quite the lineup. So please do not take this as medical advice and go out and buy all of these supplements, especially if you haven't optimized other areas discussed first. You cannot out supplement an unhealthy lifestyle. Do your own research and run any supplement that you wanna take by your primary care physician to ensure that they won't negatively interact with a health condition, medication, or supplement that you're already taking. The last tip is related to insomnia. This is a maddening condition where you just can't fall asleep, stay asleep, or get good quality sleep. Before you consider yourself to have insomnia, give the above 14 strategies a real try. This will likely take you months to fully implement and work into your routine. If after, after optimizing all 14, you still struggle with insomnia, the most effective treatment is a form of psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI. And the goal of CBTI is to help restore your confidence in your ability to sleep. And this is done through mindset work to help you eliminate any anxieties that may be preventing you from getting to sleep or staying asleep. I have a couple great episodes with Dr. Valerie Cacho, a sleep expert that you can watch next. And be sure to subscribe if you enjoyed today's video. You can also check out our services below to help you lose weight and lower insulin resistance.